everyone. My name is Jenna Butler. I am the Deputy Director of the Coalition for Public Safety. You're going to hear a little bit more about me and, and our organization during this panel conversation, but um, I wanted to take a, just a quick moment before we get started um, to just express how incredibly grateful and appreciative we are to be a part of this fly-in. Um, the, the Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce is just truly incredible in their advocacy and outreach. Um, and they were one of the first and, and really most influential chambers to start working on criminal justice reform across the country. Um, they did it for a really kind of um, straightforward reason, workforce. We need skilled, talented workforce in Pennsylvania and across our country. And they saw this as one of the ways that they could help to strengthen and grow that workforce every single day. Um, you know, it's, it's to the point now where when my organization is starting to consider an issue, um, Matt and Jen and their incredible team over there are one of the first calls that we make because they've probably already thought about this issue. They've evaluated it for the Pittsburgh area and for the state as a whole, thought about what their members would wanna see from that issue. And we can work together and partner and really um, develop some, some extraordinary policies that advance the state of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> But it's not just here in Pennsylvania, they're actually nationwide now. Uh, Matt traveled out to Nashville uh, with us and spoke to a, about 50 state legislators from across the country and got a few plugs in for the Pittsburgh area as well. Um, and then a few of those folks were so uh, amazed by what the chamber has done that they have brought him out as far as Albuquerque to talk about some of the work. Um, so it's just, it's really cool to see all of the things that the chamber is able to do. And we're just so proud to be a partner uh, with them on these issues and with this event. Um, I will close with this. Um, our economy has been dealt to a fairly tough blow uh, with the COVID pandemic, and it's going to take a long time to come back and to recover from the last few months. But because of the work that Pennsylvania has done and that the Chamber has done to grow Pennsylvania's workforce already, Pennsylvania is starting off in a really enviable position. And so I thank you for everything that you've been doing um, to advance these issues and to advance the state of Pennsylvania. And I'm so proud to be a partner with you in this. Jen, over to you. Oh, oh, almost unmuted. Thank you so much, Jenna. Um, we really appreciate those comments and same, same back at you. You, Holly, Cortland, your whole team have just been fantastic partners over the past few years. And it's been a pleasure working with you uh, to move these very important issues forward. Um, and of course, thank you also for your support on this panel in particular today. So welcome again to our panelists this afternoon and to all of our attendees participating on this webinar. I am Jen Beer, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, which is the advocacy affiliate for the Allegheny Conference. For those of you who have been with us during these virtual fly-in discussions over the last few days, thank you. We have arrived at the last um, of our series here of panels, which rounds out discussions with our elected leaders and experts on issues that are key to impacting our region. And for our panel this afternoon, we will be discussing criminal justice reform and particularly the role that clean slate legislation has played in providing greater economic opportunity um, at the state level and hopefully soon the role it can play at the federal level as well. So our chamber has been supportive, um, as Jenna said, with many different criminal justice reforms at the state level. Um, in fact, we even weighed in on another bill that is moving in the state Senate, um, likely right now, uh, earlier today. So we'll hear how Pennsylvania has been a leader in this space, um, but we also want to hear what the federal government is looking at to accomplish um, in the criminal justice reform space as well. So we have a great lineup of panelists that have extensive experience at both the federal and state level, and I will get to introducing them in just a second. Uh, but first, just a couple of comments to set some groundwork for the attendees here in our discussion. Um, this panel is intended to be interactive, so attendees, please feel free to ask, uh, you know, if you have a question, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom, please feel free to use it. And we will do our best to sort through, get through as many questions as we can and hit on um, as many different topics and issues for the panelists. So I will now um, be introducing each panelist one at a time. I will be asking them to give uh, a few brief remarks, um, talk about you know, your work in this space um, and your vision for how you think we can move um, these really bipartisan issues forward in both Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C. 
So I am very pleased to start with Congressman Guy Rushenthaler, representative from Pennsylvania's 14th U.S. House District. Um, and before that, he was state senator for the great 37th district here in, in southwestern Pennsylvania. Congressman, it's, it's great to see you again. I hope you've been well. And uh, would you like to offer some introductory remarks? Yeah, absolutely, Jen. Thanks. Uh, first off, thanks for the introduction. I appreciate I appreciate it and I uh, appreciate being on. And I want to thank Whip Harris as well. Uh, and of course, uh, Jenna Butler as well for, uh, for being on the panel, looking forward to it. I, um, j just by way of background, when I was a district judge, and uh, for those of you who don't know, I was a district judge in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. I, when I was a district judge, I saw firsthand just how many people came out of that magistrate court and the really the jail or prison to street revolving door. And I knew that it was, it was a problem. And I saw the, just the struggles and the obstacles that people face as they were working their, their, the way they're trying to rebuild their lives, really. <clears throat> so when I got to the state Senate, I knew there was a problem. And I helped with, um, with our clean slate bill, which was the first clean slate bill in the entire United States to pass. I'm really proud of that. Um, and what this bill did is it gave 1 million Pennsylvanians a second chance to really re-enter the American dream without the stigma of that, uh, the criminal conviction on their record. And I, you know, I always say um, that it's one thing to be tough on crime, but we have to be smart on crime. And I say that the toughest that we can be on crime is reducing recidivism rates. So when somebody says that this legislation or when criminal justice reform is somehow soft on crime or being smart on crime is synonymous with being soft on crime, it's complete, it's complete hogwash. If we reduce recidivism rates, there's no other way to be harder on crime because by definition, we're stopping future crime from taking place. I think we have to keep that in mind as we talk about these issues. But if we have fewer crimes being committed, we clearly have fewer victims and that should be our ultimate goal when we're working on these issues. So um, just to talk about a few issues that I'm working on here in, uh, in DC, I have the federal version of the Clean Slate Bill and I've got a great uh, Democrat co-sponsor, Lisa Blunt Rochester from Delaware. She's been great to work with and I could talk about the details on that if you want. And then um, I have two bills with uh, subcommittee chairman Karen Bass, who's been great to work with. She, um, as many people know, she's a huge advocate on criminal justice reform and these issues. So um, our first bill is the Protecting the Health and Wellness of Babies and Pregnant Women in Custody Act. And what this does is it provides incarcerated women with access to pregnancy-related healthcare services. And that includes everything from mental health, uh, dietary needs, um, to just general uh, well-being and, and uh, medical issues. So I'm really excited about that bill and we can talk more about it, but it just passed at a judiciary committee last week. And then we also have the One Stop Community Reentry Center Grant Program Act. And what that does is it creates grants for uh, One Stop uh, shops where individuals that are leaving, uh, in, that are not incarcerated, they're leaving uh, prison, come out, they get housing, education, uh, employment assistance, not only placement, but also job skill training. And just to, to throw out a stat, uh, this is a huge issue. We have 600,000 Americans that are leaving prison every year. So if we can get those individuals, these resources, and especially at one spot, uh, one location to do that and consolidate all those services, that's gonna help those 600,000 individuals re-enter society, hopefully get on their feet and stop again that revolving door between prison and the street. Right now, roughly two thirds of those that are released are expected to come back into the system. If we can reduce that even by, uh, you know, even by some margin, it's a huge win for us on this. So uh, moving forward, I think that there's a huge appetite in, in Congress and in DC. You've seen the administration take a very proactive stance on criminal justice reform. Clearly, we've had uh, uh, bipartisan wins in, in Congress. So moving forward, I'm really optimistic about where we uh, take criminal justice reform in the future. And with that, Jenna, I'll hand it back over to you. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for those comments. Let me check um, if we have Representative Jordan Harris before I introduce him. Is he? Is he on the line with us? I think I saw him pop in before, but I just wanted to make sure. 
Not yet. Okay. Well, I will move then to um, Jenna Botler. Um, Jenna is Deputy Director for the Coalition for Public Safety. Um, you heard from Jenna a little bit before. She's been a fantastic partner of ours on these efforts. But Jenna, um, maybe you could give a little bit more background um, on your organization um, and some of the work you do. Because I know you're not only in Pennsylvania, you're, you're across the nation. Um, so maybe just a little bit of background for us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you again for having me with y'all today. It's really a pleasure and an honor um, to speak on this panel along with the congressman and, and the representative. <clears throat> um, I want to actually back up a little bit um, to even before our organization was started to talk a little bit more about this issue and why it's so important. And the congressman said something very important um, that I, I really want to drive home is that working on criminal justice reform is the tough on crime approach. And when I first kind of realized that it was it was very life changing for me, not only because I now fund a career working on criminal justice issues, um, but it really changed how I think about how government resources in the criminal justice system are used. And the first time that I really came face to face with this idea was I was working down in Texas at a think tank and there was a survey that they did of people involved in the criminal justice system. And one of the questions on the survey was, would you rather spend um, six to nine months in a jail in a lockup or would you rather do two years on probation? And I thought, well, that's a dumb question. Like who would ever choose to go behind bars? Who, who would choose to have their freedom and their liberty restricted in that way? Well, I was wrong. Um, over 70% of those asked um, said that they would rather do a short uh, six to nine month stay in jail rather than community supervision. And I was incredibly perplexed by this. I mean, I would never in a million years choose to go behind bars. And, you know, I asked around and, and tried to figure out why this was happening. And they said that for those individuals um, that are kind of in that mindset, it is way easier for them to spend six months sitting in a jail cell than it is to do two years of community supervision. They think that's the hard option because they have to get a job, they have to do check-ins, they maybe have to do some drug and alcohol treatment, they maybe have to do some counseling. Like there's a lot of stuff involved with that. And I just started thinking, I mean, if they think that's the hard option, then I want them to do that. Like I want the criminal justice system to have that sort of accountability and to have that, that um, kind of meaning for them. And so that's really is that notion is what underpins all of this work. We're not being soft on crime, we're being way tougher on crime. And we are allowing individuals the chance to actually use the criminal justice system to turn their lives around, to rehabilitate themselves, to exit the system and never come back. Uh, the congressman mentioned the, the recidivism rates that are just appallingly high. They are. I mean, if out of every three bridges that this country builds, if two of them crumbled within five years, we'd all be pretty upset and probably stop driving over bridges that the government built. Um, and yet we have those sorts of outcomes from the criminal justice system every single day. It's time for a better way. Uh, so that for many, many years, because of that same sentiment, uh, bipartisan organizations have been growing across the country to work on criminal justice reforms with members on both sides of the aisle, using data and research to back up uh, our work. The Coalition for Public Safety was founded five years ago uh, with that exact aim in mind, is to make sure that these bipartisan reforms had that backing, were successfully signed into law and implemented with fidelity. Um, to date, the, the coalition, along with its C4 sister organization, the Justice Action Network, has worked in over 20 states. We've been proud to support over 140 bills becoming law, uh, including right here in Pennsylvania. We were so proud to support the original Clean Slate Act that Congressman Rushenthaler worked on when he was in the legislature, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later today. Um, we've also worked on occupational licensing reforms that were signed into law this year um, that's going to open up avenues for more Pennsylvanians to get to work and to provide for those their families. So I'll wrap up just by saying I am just so pleased to be here with you talking about these incredibly important issues. I appreciate the chamber and everything that they're doing. Congressman Rushenthaler's leadership in Congress uh, is, is really extraordinary to see. Um, and of course, Jordan Harris, uh, none of us would be able to be working on these things without Jordan Harris in the legislature. So thank you all for having me. Thanks, Jenna. And so folks, we are still waiting on our third panelist. Um, as you know, with the uh, legislature in, in Pennsylvania and DC, you never can tell when they're called to vote. So he is on his way back from voting. So I will actually take the opportunity to give his brief introduction now. And hopefully um, when the representative joins us, he can just join the discussion. Um, but the third that we hope to 
have on any moment um, is Pennsylvania's House Democratic Whip from the 186th Pennsylvania Legislative District, which is out of Philadelphia. So we'll, we won't hold that against him when, when he joins. Um, but he's also chair and founder of the Bipartisan Bicameral Criminal Justice Reform Caucus in the Pennsylvania Legislature. So he has worked um, very well with um, his fellow um, House Republicans on a lot of uh, criminal justice reform measures over the past few years. Um, as Jenna said, been a real leader in Pennsylvania. So hopefully when he joins us, um, we can just jump him right into the conversation. Um, but Jenna and Congressman Rushenthaler, if you'd like to turn your cameras back on, um, we will get started. Um, so I'll kick it off. Um, you know, we, we are here to really help highlight um, and advance federal clean slate legislation. Um, you know, we know that Pennsylvania recently passed its own historic version, um, but I would just ask you if you could each go into um, a little bit of your own perspectives um, on federal clean slate. Congressman, perhaps uh, talk a little bit about, yeah, what this legislation would do at the federal level, and also what drove you to take the lead on it um, down in Washington. It sounds good, John, but you just got to call me Guy, though, okay? Please. Okay, I'll um, try. Okay, so uh, so just a quick personal story. I had a uh, really good friend. We were lifeguards together at uh, Sandcastle Water Park, and one summer she didn't come back, and we didn't know what happened. Totally dropped off the face of the earth. I found out later that during the uh, during the winter, she was addicted, got addicted to drugs, uh, pretty bad narcotics, and committed some crimes, and she had a felony conviction. Uh, on a record from all that. So we reconnected after I got out of the Navy. And I saw that a lot of the, the dreams that she had just simply were not possible, to be frank, with these convictions on a record. Uh, she'd wanted to be a lawyer, much like, uh, just like myself. And so I saw what she was going through. So just on a personal story, uh, I really felt bad for her. And this was someone who had a great upbringing, who was uh, a great student, and I just saw how one or two bad decisions could really stigmatize you moving forward, not only getting into college, but even it's very difficult to even rent an apartment sometimes because a lot of landlords look at your background record. And then, of course, being a lawyer was tough. Thankfully, now she's a, she's a paralegal. Um, she's back on track, but a lot of it is because she's been able to clean up some of the records. So that's a, a personal story I've, I've already talked about when I was a magisterial district judge in the South Hills about seeing the stigma uh, that, that people are struggling with and re-entry uh, coming, coming back in, uh, in, in into, uh, into public after being in jail or in prison. So that's, a, that's something. And then also, I was a uh, defense attorney and a prosecutor in the Navy. So I kind of saw both, both sides of it. So from a personal level, that's kind of where I was coming from and experience. And then from a policy issue, I just think this makes sense, right? We should give people second chances. Also, if you want to talk about the, uh, Jenna talked about the economic benefits of this. There's a huge economic loss to society when we don't allow people to re-enter society fully and uh, fulfill their maximum potential. So anything that we can do to alleviate that, and I'm talking about, of course, nonviolent crimes or our exceptions to this, but for your, for your typical nonviolent non crimes, I think that we should remove that stigma and allow people to move up in the workplace, pursue the careers they want to pursue. And that gives us a lot of economic benefits. We, of course, have higher revenue and people are earning more money. We have a growing economy. So there's a huge economic uh, perspective uh, to this as well. Uh, we, I'll stop there because I think I hit the question, but did you want me to get into detail about the specific bills? Or were you talking general? No, I, I, that was a, that was a great overview um, of, okay. where, of, you know, where you are. And I do believe we have representative Harris. Um, if you're able to turn on your mic and camera. Here we are. I'm here. Hi, representative. How, How are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here. Sorry I'm late. I literally just left the floor of the house. Uh, so I'm li literally just getting off the floor. So I'm glad to be here. No, not a problem at all. Um, I hope you don't mind, but I already did your fabulous introduction, um, giving you lots of credit for all of the good work you're doing um, in Pennsylvania on uh, Clean Slate, um, but also all of the other criminal justice reforms that I know uh, you and um, your colleagues are working on. 
So if you don't mind, if we can just, we were talking about federal clean slate reform, um, mm -hmm. also talking about how Pennsylvania has been a leader in this area as well. Um, are you able to give maybe a little bit of uh, background on the process of how Pennsylvania came um, to, to um, accomplish clean slate? Perhaps we can learn some lessons so we can help move forward this, this federal bill on it as well. Sure, back in, uh, I think it was 2016, uh, there was a guy named Dennis Giorno, who is a government relations professional for a firm called Milady. Uh, I think at that time it was Milady and Wooten, but now it's just Milady. But anyway, so Dennis comes to me. Dennis knows that criminal justice is my thing, and I've been working on it since getting into the legislature. So he comes to me and says, we have this group called the Justice Action Network. And I see Jenna here. What's up, Jenna? Hey, how are you? Uh, and, and so, so Dennis says to me, you know, we want to do this bill called Clean Slate. It kind of expands on some of the stuff that I had worked on with uh, Senator Stuart Greenleaf in the past, but, but not just looking at how we seal records, but sealing records automatically. Because what we found was that even though in Pennsylvania we had a process by which you could seal a record, lots of people were not taking advantage of that. So, you know, the, 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 the best thing to do is to seal the record automatically. So they tell me about this woman who I served with named Cheryl Delosier, who I've never worked with. And all I knew about Cheryl was that she was a victim's advocate. And, th and their theory was because Cheryl's a victim's advocate, her, uh, uh, a rural white woman Republican, and me, a black, black, a big black Democrat with a beard from South Philadelphia, Somehow, some way, if we could get those two folks working together on this bill, we could possibly get something done. So it was me and Cheryl DeLosier in the House, in the Senate. It was uh, uh, my partner, Senator Anthony Williams, and, and, and Senator Scott Wagner. Senator Scott Wagner, who just a few months after that, I think, I don't know if he was or, or not, but he would start to run for governor himself. So it was a whole lot of messy politics into this whole thing. But, but, but what we understood in Pennsylvania is that if we got this done, we could help out a lot of people. So we worked together, Cheryl and I actually uh, grew very close, became friends through the whole process, and we were able to use um, our political will to get a bill uh, through the House, through the Senate, and for the governor to sign. To date, well, maybe not to date, last time I checked, I think it was in June, Clean Slate in Pennsylvania had sealed somewhere around 35 million records uh, 47 million offenses and helped 1.1 million people since uh, uh, since we got clean slate done. Um, so you know, it, it's one of those things where you you know, uh, Cheryl always puts it: you got to find a sweet spot for both Democrats and Republicans to agree. But I, but once you once for me once you get to trust that the the folks that you're working with are really trying to move the needle, because I'll, I'll tell you as a Democrat, I get a lot of people that'll say. Um, you know, why would you work with them? Why would you trust them? There's no way. I mean, think of I, I'm I'm a I'm a liberal Democrat from Philly who's working with groups like the American Conservatives Union, the uh, Americans for Prosperity. You know, and and I'm be honest with you, I get in trouble sometimes. Like folks are like, well, why would you work with them? But the truth is, I think Frederick Douglass said it. He said, I will work with anyone to do good, and with no one to do bad. And for me, at the end of the day, I got to go home to South Philly to my folks and let them know that I'm doing something in Harrisburg that's gonna make their lives better. Oh, excellent, excellent, yeah. And if I could just also add, um, you know, Jenna, you talk, and this gets a little bit to your comments, uh, Representative Harris, but um, Jenna, now sort of moving to you, um, another, I know you talked a little bit about why um, your organization and even the chamber um, being supportive because of sort of the workforce angle um, but also, I just wanted to point out that, that we're also very interested um, in sort of the economic opportunity and the equity that these policies bring. And so I think just sort of piggyback off of some of uh, Representative Harris's remarks that, um, you know, that's why we're, we're so pleased that this has been such a success. Um, so Jenna, sort of, I mean, either on workforce or economic opportunity, any other sort of comments that you'd like to share while we're chatting about the, the Clean Slate Bill? Um, either from your perspective in Pennsylvania or nationally? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the economic benefits of this cannot actually be underscored. Um, it's estimated that barriers to employment for folks with a criminal record actually cost our GDP $87 billion and is a huge chunk of, out of our economy that we're losing every single year. And we know that current expungement policies are rarely taken advantage of. Um, it's estimated about 6% of people that are eligible for a traditional expungement actually go and get it. Uh, because it's, it's really hard, right? And you know, it's you have to get a lawyer maybe, sometimes you don't, sometimes you have to file a petition, then you gotta find a judge. And like, there's just a whole bunch of steps that most people just don't even try to attempt it. However, the economic benefits for the person are also is significant. Um, one study found that the first year after somebody actually did receive an expungement, their wages went up 22% in one year alone. And so we've got these, these extraordinary benefits for the individual and for the economy as a whole. I'll also point out that the automatic nature of Clean Slate actually reduces red tape and bureaucracy as well. It's a lot easier for the government to effectuate this kind of a program. There's a lot less um, time and, and kind of wasted resources that are spent on this. So once you get it up and running, you're going to see those reductions in um, kind of docket time and court personnel time um, that, that are uh, unfortunate aspect of current expungement practices. Um, and so there's, there's really something to like no matter how you're looking at this policy. If you're looking at it as second chance and people have earned them, you got them. If you're looking at economic benefits for the individual and for the national economy, you got it there too. If you're looking for smaller government, we got that for you too. Um, and so that's what I think both um, uh, the representative and the congressman were really talking about when we talk about this in a bipartisan way. It's because it appeals to both parties. It's because it appeals to Americans of all stripes. Uh, we just did some public opinion polling on clean slate and we found almost 70% of voters support this on both sides of the aisle. Um, so this this is really kind of one of those rare policy areas that when it's done right, the way that the congressman and the representative are doing it, it is truly win, win, win. That's great. You, you sort of hit on my uh, next question, which I was going to sort of uh, aim to you, Congressman, uh, Russian thought guy. Um, and, and that does go to the bipartisan effort, um, you know, not only with Clean Slate, um, as evidenced through your uh, partnership with Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, but really um, so many criminal justice reform issues. Um, and so just, I mean, do you have any sense on, you know, why, or you might want to comment on why um, of all the issues on your plate in DC, um, you feel that Clean Slate has generated so much bipartisan support? Well, for a lot of uh, what Jenna was referencing, you know, there's so much common ground. There's something for everybody to get behind in this. There, there's also a real political reason. It's that one in three Americans have some kind of criminal record uh, out there. So, right, so your constituents, one in three of your constituents are going to be facing this issue. So it's really good uh, politically. And, and although a lot of people don't like to admit that, that plays a lot into why, why politicians do what they do when they're in elected office. But I, I think that there is a strong libertarian streak to a lot of this that plays with elements of the Republican Party, a limited government notion. Um, and there's also that uh, that the main street Republicans that are behind it because it makes good fiscal and economic sense and it grows GDP and the economy. Then the other side of the odds, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons to get behind this. So uh, it's very, I've, I found it very easy to work uh, with my Democrat colleagues on the other side of the aisle, of course, and there's a lot of energy. Uh, I've taken it up because I'm on the judiciary committee here and I'm uh, on the subcommittee on, um, on crime and courts. So it's in the jurisdiction. And I specifically asked for judiciary because I wanted to continue my criminal justice reform work that I started in the state Senate. And of course that would be on the subcommittee that I'm on. So uh, I'm, I'm in the right place at the right time on the right committees and, and had the background coming in from the state Senate to accomplish some things. Great. And Representative Harris, um, you've already noted, we've, we've talked a little bit about your partnership with Representative Delosier and you've been such an exciting team to watch in PA. Um, are you able to comment on anything next uh, moving forward on, on your agenda with her? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're like, you know, two days away in, in my mind of, of, of nailing some, some things on uh, probation reform. We've been working on probation reform in Pennsylvania for probably about a year now. And um, I, we're, we're very, very close to getting it done. Um, our, my, my, my staff and her staff are really trying to nail down where that sweet spot is. Um, 
to get both Democrats and Republicans support on it. But but we're very close. My my hope is in the next week or two, you'll see a probation bill moving its way through the House of Representatives, which which for those that don't understand it, like in Pennsylvania, you know, any interaction with police can end you up back in, in jail uh, for a probation violation. And it costs the, the taxpayers of Pennsylvania well over a billion dollars for, for, for these, uh, uh, these uh, violations. Um, um, our recidivism rate costs a billion dollars. The violations themselves cost us a hundred million dollars. And in a time where you know, we're in a, a budget crunch because of COVID. We need to, you need to save every dollar we can to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. And, and with that being said, what we know is that there are folks on probation that we need to focus our attention on. There are many that we don't. So it's like, you know, it, it, it's not a one size fits all thing. And it sh the system shouldn't be one size fits all. We should definitely tailor what we're doing to the person, to the individual. So that's why we're working on probation reform. Uh, like I said, we're very close to getting it done. That's great. Thank you for the update. Um, Jenna, let's, let's talk a little bit more about what's going on in other parts of the country. Um, is, is there any exciting news um, in other states? Or, I mean, I know Pennsylvania has been such a leader, but maybe um, any other exciting updates from other states? And even perhaps, you know, like we talk about clean slate, the state level transitioning to the federal level. So similarly, are, are there any other policies that are at the state level that we might want to put in front of the congressman to uh, to consider at the federal level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you mentioned, Pennsylvania is a leader. And, and just on clean slate alone, uh, Pennsylvania has already inspired other states to act. Um, but a year ago, Utah passed its own version of clean slate. Uh, and about an hour ago, uh, Michigan passed its own version of clean slate. Um, and each of those states kind of cite back to what Pennsylvania was able to do um, because they know what an incredible um, kind of victory that was. And, and Pennsylvania just showed them the pathway towards being able to do this. So really exciting. I mean, to see that, um, you know, nationally, we do see a lot of these reform issues kind of bubble up and start to become something for, for Congress to perhaps implement at the federal level or to um, um, and somehow incentivize state action through their, their power of the purse. Um, the Congressman mentioned some of the, the legislation that he's working on regarding um, pregnant women um, in federal facilities. That was something that we saw several states take action on in the last few years, um, and certainly something that, that we hope to see the federal government learn from. Um, as, as we all know, President Donald Trump signed um, the First Step Act into law back in uh, late 2018. That legislation itself was inspired by the states um, to the representative's point about needing better outcomes out of probation it was some of those same incentives of needing to tailor criminal justice system responses and accountability to each individual person, getting away from the one size fits all. And that's what the First Step Act was intended to do, um, to reduce recidivism coming out of federal prison facilities. We're already getting data out of that that's showing this having a huge effect in its first year of implementation alone. So that's really exciting. Um, I think the other major trend, though, that we're seeing, and I certainly think this is one that the congressman will be grappling with a little bit at the federal level, is um, figuring out how to make the justice system respond to COVID for however long we're going to continue dealing with this thing. Um, so initially, kind of the, the gut reaction was we need to, to reduce in-person contact, just like we were all reducing in-person contact. Um, so the justice system started doing um, you know, remote, remote court um, dates and appointments. Um, they started doing kind of um, remote check-ins between probation officers and probationers. And we realized as we were doing that, that we were saving a lot of money, number one. Um, and number two, we were actually getting better outcomes. Um, I'll just give you one example on the probation side of things. Say you've got somebody who's in year two of their probation um, they uh, have to go in every single month and meet with their probation officer, which means they have to take either a full day or at least a half a day off of work. They have to go and sit around and wait, and, and they've got a lot of kind of time on their hands that's not really happening. Um, their supervisor may or may not understand if there's a delay, who knows? Uh, so it's really impacting this person's everyday life. Um, because we're forced to reduce those in-person things during COVID, um, that person now makes a five-minute phone call to their probation officer, or maybe they check in via, via Zoom, just like this platform or some other video-based monitoring system. Um, they can go on to work. They don't 
don't have to take the day off. Their supervisor doesn't get upset with them. And the probation officer themselves are saving time and money with this approach. And so states right now are thinking about, okay, what lessons can we take from this era that have shown us that they're more effective and how do we codify them and make them work for us long term? Um, another one that I'll mention is uh, there's a judge uh, down in southern Louisiana um, that started doing, uh, he, he created a, a chat bot, which I don't even know what that was until he explained it to me, um, but it basically, it kind of automatically um, texts people reminders of different court dates and things like that. He uses QR codes um, so that they can let him know when they're there ready for their appointment. So they're not sitting around with other people. They just walk in and they're ready. Um, I mean, these are things that he did because of COVID and he's now saying, hey, this actually worked really well for me. I'm going to keep on doing this. How do I do that? Um, and so I think that's going to be the biggest thing that we see moving forward is how we can make the, the criminal justice system more technologically responsive, how we can use it to increase accountability and to reduce, reduce unnecessary costs and burdens. Um, and I'm really excited to see the innovation um, from across the country that hopefully will inspire future action by, uh, by the federal government. That those last few points are really interesting, Jenna. We've been talking in, in every single one of our panels, um, you know, we've done a series over this week, and the tech and innovation um, part has come up in every single one in transportation and infrastructure, um, and energy, sustainability, and then the last one we just had was on tech and innovation. So I feel like that really should just be a theme that cuts through, um, quite honestly, all of all of these issues. So it's it's great to hear that too. Congressman, did you want to say something? I felt like you were going to jump in. Oh, I'm, get, I'm getting told I'm getting really close on the next vote window. So oh, I, I probably no. only have like four or five minutes and I've got to go. I, I hate to do this, but as, as Whip Harris is, is dealing with, we're in between the vote series here in DC as well. We, we totally understand that. Um, well, I, I will just, I'll give you the floor. I mean, is there any, uh, any last comments or anything that you wanted to touch on that we didn't bring up? Um, please feel free. The well, uh, Jen, there's so much to talk about when it comes to this issue. It, it is a real all-encompassing issue when we're talking about criminal justice reform. It's so multifaceted. Uh, I guess just uh, at, at the end of the day, I think that people are beginning to see that we need to do something to, to address recidivism. And I truly believe that as we start to work more and more on that, we're going to come to see that one of the ways we do this is through making sure that people not only are focused on uh, skills for employment, job training, making sure they have the education necessary to come out and get jobs, but also dealing with uh, substance abuse and mental health issues. And when I was a district judge, when I was a defense attorney, I can tell you that more often than not, I mean, a staggering amount, probably 80, 90% of the time, the person in front of me had a substance abuse issue. A lot of times that substance abuse issue was being caused by a, an untreated or undiagnosed mental illness. So I'd like to see us focus on substance abuse screening in our courts and making sure that we prioritize uh, treatment over punishment. And then if there is a mental health issue, making sure that individuals are getting the care, whether it be in pretrial confinement, confinement, or after their release. So I think that's going to be an integral part. Um, and then I'd re remiss, we were talking about COVID. Uh, you know, I used to set pretrial confinement uh, parameters. And I think that as you see individuals get released, the question that I had as a former uh, MDJ is, if, if individuals were released now, then why were they in pretrial confinement to begin with? That's really destructive to their life. It's very, uh, they may lose a job. Um, clearly there's familial issue, issues with a family. So I think that it's very clear that people that are in pretrial confinement should only be there for two reasons. One, because of their flight risk, or two, they're a danger to the community. And if that's the case, they should still, they should still be in pretrial confinement. So the, those that were released, the question is, why were they in pretrial confinement to begin with? Pretrial confinement is not a punishment. Um, so I, I think that's just some of the things we need to take a look at as we move forward. But I'm really excited to see where the two bills I have with Karen Bass go. I, I'm cautiously optimistic we'll pass them. And then with um, the Lisa Blunt Rochester bill, which is the federal version of Clean Slate, I am trying to get that amended into the next COVID relief package if we do it. And I'm doing it trying to say that it's germane because it deals with an economic issue and we can tie um, clean slate into economic recovery. And I think that's a valid point as, uh, as Jenna was discussing. So thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, Whip Harris, good to see you again, even though if it's remotely, hope all is well in Harrisburg. And thanks for everybody uh, for inviting me on the panel. Sorry I have to leave.
No problem. Thank you so much for joining us, Guy. It was great to see you again and appreciate your time. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. All right. See ya. Well, if, if Jenna and Representative Harris have just a couple more minutes, um, we, we can uh, continue our discussion. Um, I actually uh, wanted to maybe twist a little away from criminal justice reforms, um, but really get back to this issue, the underlying issue of sort of opportunity and equity. And um, I think sometimes um, we just think about criminal justice reforms, but there are other fundamental um, systemic reasons um, with or issues with the justice system itself. Um, so just any thoughts on either Jenna, your organization or Rep Representative Harris on pieces of legislation, um, things like access to counsel or um, any other issues that could really get to more of the systemic, um, you know, issues that are sort of underlying here. Either one of you? Yeah, yeah so, so, so for me, there, there, there are a lot of other issues and um, uh, I work very closely with Keir Bradford Gray in Philadelphia, who is our chief defender. Um, she's created this, this program called uh, Participatory Defense. And, and, and what she does is go, goes around and, and, and her staff, they actually train folks and families on how to participate in their loved one's defense. How to, you know, how to gather information, you know, what information is pertinent, what information is vital. You know, the things that those with paid uh, lawyers get to do, um, she is um, helping to educate communities on that. So th there, there's things around that. The other big thing for me uh, is, um, you know, while you see a lot of civil unrest going on in our country, um, you know, just, just today, uh, uh, Breonna Taylor, who was an African-American woman who literally was in her own home, uh, who was killed in her, her own home by police officers. Only one of the officers was indicted today. Now, you know, regardless of where you stand on police or policing, I think we all can be, should be able to agree that accountability is a must and is necessary in all facets of, of, of public service and public trust. So um, members of the uh, legislature uh, have been working on some reforms to the police department uh, and policing. And, 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 and that, for me, is, 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 is very much uh, connected to the criminal justice system. Like, for example, um, um, we, did a, we um, looked at some of our police data and saw that in certain police districts, in this one particular police district, African Americans were stopped, you know, four or five times more than, 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 than their white counterparts. But um, when they were being stopped, only, only on a limited amount of time was, was there any contraband found. Um, but their white counterparts had a higher propensity of having contraband being found on them. So, you know, that's the actual issue with policing and how we police communities. And, you know, it's extremely important for me, um, while we talk about criminal justice, because it's all a system, it's all connected, that people have faith in, in the folks who, uh, who they consent to be governed by. And, and I'll just add, if, if I can, um, absolutely everything uh, that the representative said. One of the, the big issues that, that, like you said, kind of infuses every single part of the criminal justice system is the current lack of transparency. And so to truly address some of the underlying issues and the underlying inequities that are rampant throughout the system um, is that we need far more transparency and understanding of current practices, um, of data, of outcomes. Um, one of the things that they, I spend a lot of time thinking about and, and haven't yet figured out the answer, but um, the plea deal process is one of the most unequal parts of the criminal justice system. Um, what you are um, offered uh, as a part of a plea deal, what you ultimately agree to, what your sentence ultimately is depends on so many factors like who your attorney is um, do you have a public defender or a private attorney um, do you have all of the information at hand who's involved in the plea deal process it is one of the most um, opaque parts of the criminal justice system and there right now uh, there is no way to get better data on that nobody can figure it out because so many of these plea deals are conducted either um, off paper meaning you know in terms of a conversation um, some of them are never reported um, if the plea deal you know, breaks down, there is just no information that allows us to truly understand what's going on. 
And I liken it to kind of a grand jury process. Um, grand juries are um, convened, uh, like the one that, that the representative mentioned, um, to evaluate a case and to decide whether or not charges should be brought. Um, it was a, a, a central principle um, that our founding fathers wanted as a part of our criminal justice system that people would have a chance to take a look at the facts and evaluate it for themselves. Why don't we do that for plea deals? Why are we not granted the same amount of information and knowledge? I would like to know how my district attorney, who I elect, um, is conducting these plea deals. I would like to know if I think they're equitable or not. And so that's just one example, but throughout the system at every single aspect and juncture, we need more information and we need more transparency. And I truly do believe that once we have that information and that transparency, we will be able to collectively um, sit down and say, you know what, that system makes sense, this one doesn't, we need to adjust this. There's something, there's something misfiring, there's something not working here. Um, and so that's gonna be a critical component moving forward uh, to really allow our country to retain its faith in the criminal justice system and the outcomes that it's producing. Thank you. Thank you both for that. I appreciate your, your comments and your insights there. Is there, is there any low hanging fruit or um, any um, legislation that either of you are aware of that, that we should really have at the forefront of our radar on, on those issues um, from the chamber's perspective? I'll jump in real quickly first, if, if you don't mind, Representative. Um, you, you touched on this very briefly, but there is legislation um, that the Senate Committee uh, just approved yesterday, um, House Bill 440, uh, which is legislation that will extend clean slate to those um, who have received a full pardon, um, as well as those that uh, have paid their all of their restitution in the underlying case, but may have one or two fines or fees still outstanding. Um, that's a really important part of this. Um, fines and fees are a very onerous part of the criminal criminal justice system and, and really are standing in the way of folks being able to move on um, with these cases. Uh, the representative talked about probation reforms. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't call those low hanging fruits, <laughs> but they are, they're certainly next on the agenda and next up. Um, and so we're really excited to see those come about. Um, and then the last one that I'll mention, uh, it's not on the, on the table for this year, but we're certainly hoping that'll be coming up in the next year, is looking at making some driver's license suspension reforms retroactive. Um, the legislature took that step of reforming license suspension practices, uh, I believe the year before last, basically saying licenses should be suspended if there's like a public safety issue or a threat to somebody on the road, but they should not be suspended just for a failure to pay a fine or a fee. And um, that's very counterproductive. Research actually shows that folks continue to drive even with a suspended license, um, which puts all of us on the road at risk. Um, so the legislature um, reformed that practice already. However, there are still um, uh, quite a few Pennsylvanians that have a previously suspended license for a failure to pay a fine and fee. We need to go back in and, and fix that for them. Um, and actually, that's, I think that's going to be one of the most popular issues uh, across the country in 2021. I know of at least six or seven other states are going to be working on that exact same thing. Um, so I'm really excited to work on that one. Yeah, thanks. We, we did weigh in. I think I mentioned this before, but we did weigh in with the House and then today um, with the Senate on 440. So uh, hopefully they're voting on that uh, right about now or very soon. Um, let me check the Q&A. Um, hold on, I'm having a slight te technical difficulty here. Um, well, while I'm trying to pull up the Q&A. Um, any, we're, we are kind of actually running down to time. Um, Representative Harris, um, any um, issues that you would like to raise um, before we start to close out? Anything we didn't touch on that, that you're uh, particularly passionate about in this space? Um, real quick again, we just wanna thank you for your, your great leadership um, on these issues. Um, like I said, it's been so wonderful to see such bipartisan support for such critical issues. Well, what I will say is that I, I think folks who are willing to be bipartisan need to get more support. And, and here's what I mean by that. And, and I get it on my end. I know my friend Cheryl gets it on her end about us working together. But here's what I believe. I believe that, you know, we can all, we can have a different view and different opinions on issues without being disagreeable. And I think at the end of the day, you know, folks want a government that works and that works for them. And, you know, we should, we should commend and applaud folks who are willing to look past, you know, ideological differences or party affiliation 
to actually move forward and get things done. So, you know, I'm excited about the possibility of us getting probation reform done. I'm excited about uh, House Bill 440. I mean, I've already quoted the numbers of folks who have been uh, impacted by clean slate. When you look at removing the, the, the fines and fees part, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions more folks will be positively affected by clean slate. And also at, at some point in time, I would like to expand clean slate because the truth is, I know this is a bad word for some folks, but there are certain felonies that do not hold the weight of the title. Um, where, 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 you know, there are certain crimes that are deemed felonies that we should be able to allow people to move forward on. No, we're not talking about murder. No, we're not talking about rape or anything like that. But there are things that folks should be able to, to move on, uh, you know, past. I mean, I, I, our, our view as a country on certain things uh, like, you know, marijuana and things like that have, or, or have changed and are changing. So we got we to gotta also right the wrongs of our past with regards to the criminal justice system, understanding that for many, a criminal record dooms them to poverty and dooms them to being second-class citizens. And we got to change that. So I'm just grateful uh, to find allies like y'all. I see my buddy, yo, Tracy, I'm on my way to Pittsburgh right now. So I see I see y'all on here. Uh, to my guy, Matt, Matt Smith, I appreciate you. Uh, y'all invited me and I'm just, I'm all, look, and Jen, I'm always glad to be in your company. Look, there's a lot of work that's getting done, that's getting done for the people of Pennsylvania. I'm just grateful to be a part. Thank you so much, Representative. We, we appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you are with voting and, and everything up in Harrisburg. So, um, Jenna, any last few comments um, from I mean, I can't possibly top that. So let me just co-sign everything that the representative just said um, and just share that uh, it is so exciting to see um, not only individuals like Representative Harris and Representative Delosier work together, but groups like the Chamber um, team up uh, on these issues, um, these unlikely allies that we have working together on this. Uh, all that tells me is that we're heading in the right direction. So thank you for everything that you all do and, and thank you for all of your members support of these issues. Oh, absolutely. We, we appreciate your partnership as well. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you again to our panelists um, for sharing all of your thoughts today. Um, we appreciate also the hard work that you all are giving to this issue. Um, and we look forward to working with you to advance both federal clean slate policy and then more efforts at the state level as well. So this brings us to our 2020 DC virtual fly-in close. Um, this was the last panel. Um, while we could not replace um, being in person with all of you um, in our typical Pittsburgh to DC reception and Hill visits, um, we hope that you have found these sessions um, informative and useful. So on behalf of the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, I would like to Again, thank all of our panelists, um, as well as all of our sponsors for their generous support. Um, and particularly for this one, the Coalition for Public Safety. Um, we appreciate their commitment and support as well. Um, without all of your help and efforts here, we wouldn't have been able to have such a successful fly-in. So thank you all again. Um, I hope to see you all in person soon and have a great day.